Uh, I'm thrilled to have uh, Valerie So, Professor Val Valerie So here again. Okay, <laughs> she has been here several times. Okay, the first time maybe two, three years ago. Maybe two years, two, 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 three, two three years, years ago. Three, maybe. Oh, three, three years ago. Yeah, I, I, probably I changed everything. <laughs> but uh, that's the, first, the beginning of mm. the COVID period. Yes. Uh, <laughs> discussing with the uh, how to uh, do all this uh, maybe screen documentary and uh, documentary related uh, issues, uh, theoretical but also empirical uh, practices. And uh, Professor So is a professor in the uh, Asian American Studies uh, in uh, San Francisco State University. She has been uh, rewarded uh, dozens and dozens. No, 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 no. Okay, a little bit of exaggerating, but dozens. <laughs> <laughs> of, uh, she has made uh, 2000 in experimental and documentary films. Okay, focusing on the social and political concerns such as the racism, uh, representation, especially the Asian people, and the history of Asian uh, living in the United States. So those are the things you, you will be watching uh, today here uh, through her film, her screening. Her recent work, Love for Taiwan, <laughs> won the American Award at the Urban Normal Film Festival in Taipei and has played and sold out okay, uh, festival audiences across North America and also Taiwan. And today I think uh, I, we invited her to share with us her view on uh, film, uh, filmmaking process, especially filmmaking in relation to practices research, and also uh, thinking processes, okay? And also as a tour or process for emancipation in terms of many, many dimensions, okay? Our ideological uh, uh, blockage uh, or our uh, ethnicity, identity politics, or our uh, understanding of the world through the the film through the camera. So she will be talking about all this. Uh, and also, how could we address this issue through creative and artistic practices uh, and uh, think of liberation, social justice, and empowerment, most importantly, both for the artist and for uh, the student, for the audience, and for those people who needed the voice okay so i'm so happy that uh she can be here generously sharing with us many of her films and she has also let uh given us a, a list of links okay so mm -hmm. it's a full uh a version of her film so uh, you can also get the access afterwards okay after of, of this session and I'm also very happy to have Professor Tim Green to be here with us as a discussion. Okay, he is a poet, an artist, a filmmaker, but also a body Bulgarian uh, theorist, and in the English department, foreign language department of our university, and also one of our uh, ICCS uh, research fellows. Mm -hmm. So welcome. So I, I believe there will be a very fruitful discussion today, both uh, between Dean and uh, Valerie, but also uh, among our students and also audience uh, online. Okay, you are all welcome to uh, join. So I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much, Professor Liu, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be back here at MSU. Um, so I'm going to talk about my film work and also a, just to, as an introduction, a little bit of a history of other uh, filmmakers who are using film in a similar way, documentary film. So, just whoops. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I get it. Okay. 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 So this is sort of um, 
the, the quote that I'm interested in looking at today. And it says, both study and struggle are necessary and intertwined components in our collective work towards creating emancipatory futures. And these are two Asian American um, scholars who discuss this in terms more of political activism and you know, thinking about uh, how how theory and practice can intertwine. But for myself as a filmmaker, I'm interested in seeing how creative work and you know, organizing and political activism are intertwined. So I'm gonna just start with a very brief uh, introduction to some earlier Asian American films and actually one Taiwanese film, which I feel like does a very similar, has done a very similar thing. And then I'll uh, show some clips from my own, from my own work as well. Okay. So, um, so uh, as you all probably know, there are many, many Asians living in the United States. I want to say there's something like, oh goodness, maybe more than 6% of the US population is now Asian. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, it's grown exponentially since the 1960s when the immigration laws changed. Before that, it was less than a half a percent. And so it's jumped up quite a bit because the US immigration laws became much more lenient. So many more people came from Asia from Latin America, from other countries besides Europe. And so, of course, now the United States is, is a very, very, very diverse, very multicultural society. And so Asian Americans, um, you know, they, there were Asian Americans living in the United States before the, the 1960s, um, of course. But, uh, and we'll see a film about some of those earlier Asians living in the US. But after the 1960s and onward, there's much more uh, of a demographic force. And so Asian Americans, but you know, they weren't necessarily represented in politics, in culture, and so forth. So um, one of the ways that Asians living in the United States try to increase their visibility, their influence, their voice in the United States was by making films, independent films, interestingly enough. And so it didn't start with crazy rich Asians. <laughs> so, so I personally, I teach a class in Asian American film history, which starts in the 60s and 70s. And a lot of people don't realize that that's, you know, there are a lot of films from then. So primarily documentaries, but there were some feature films as well. And now, of course, it's very much exploded, like crazy rich Asians or every everything everywhere all at once, right? I'm sure you can just rattle off a million of them. Zhang Chi, <laughs> that kind of thing. I wouldn't say that's an Asian American film, but it's mm -hmm. definitely a very influential Asian American representation. So, but you know, earlier than that, it was it was more difficult to see accurate representations of Asians in in film and television in the United States. There were very much stereotypical representations. Uh, Bruce Lee, of course, was very popular, so a lot of people thought all Asians knew martial arts. <laughs> Um, there was, of course, the geisha girl stereotype, right? Asian mm -hmm. women being very um, passive and subservient and uh, trying to please white men. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there was the stereotype that Asians were um, enemies, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the wars, if you think about between the United States uh, in the 20th century, were almost all against Asian countries, Vietnam, Japan, Korea, and mm -hmm. so forth, mm -hmm. in the middle of the century. So. Asians had very bad negative representations, a very stereotypical one-dimensional representations in Hollywood films. So Asian American filmmakers decided around the 1960s that they would make their own films. And they would try to represent their lives and their experiences more accurately. And so you can see here, we, there's uh, in the slide, uh, starting at the very bottom left and the upper right, those are people using very old technology. One person, I think, down in the bottom, and I believe that is Renee Tajima Pena, who mm. we'll see a clip of her when she was very, very young, using um, a very old video camera. I think it's called a porta pack. Mm. And then upper right is uh, Curtis Chin, who is another filmmaker we'll talk about, shooting with a film camera, you know, like celluloid. And then we move into the middle, that's is Don Bonus using a camcorder. And then, of course, uh, Nasheen Dabra using a really nice, fancy digital camera pretty recently. So, all right. <clears throat> Do you wish to turn off a little bit of the light? Oh, maybe, maybe we can yeah. dim the lights a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so the yeah, person okay, that I—that's oh, beautiful. Thank you. The person that I talked about in the upper uh, right, Curtis Choi, with the fancy film camera. He he directed this film in 1983 called *The Fall of the I Hotel*, the International Hotel. And um, oh, actually, did I forget a quote back there? Sorry. 
I just want to make sure I go. So it says the Asian American media movement grew from the movements for racial and social justice and cultural affirmation of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, that was a time when there were a lot of younger people becoming very politically involved and also a lot of Asian Americans becoming very politically, culturally, socially, um, you know, gain, trying to have more of a voice and an influence. Okay, so anyway, I'm jumping a little bit ahead. So this film was actually, I believe they started making this in the early 1970s and it took a good long time to finish. And it was about a struggle in San Francisco for tenants' rights, trying to save a group of elderly Filipino American men from being evicted from a hotel they had lived in, a residential hotel they had lived in for decades, near, right near Chinatown. And so many, many, many uh, people get, became involved. You can see in the bottom right corner, there's a, a picture of a very diverse group of protesters, you know, black, white, black, Latino, Asian. Um, I think that at one point there were something like three or 4,000 people who would go every day and protest to try to save this hotel. And it was very much documented by Asian American filmmakers, including Curtis Choi, who worked in collaboration with a lot of other filmmakers. And so Renee Chajma Pena, the person who was in the bottom right, left corner, she's also a writer and a professor. And she wrote, and she says, early Asian American cinema released rather than contained the raw energy infected oops, sorry, it should be that infected, young Asian Americans, both artistically and politically at the time. Behind the camera, scores of Asian American artists and activists are listed in the credits for the fall of the hotel. Before the lens, the, in the fall of the hotel documents one of the most remarkable movements in the movement history, political movement. As collective memory, the fall of the I hotel is poetic and powerful. So um, yeah, so it was very important at that time to, to make a historical record of all of this activism and speaking out that Asian Americans were doing at that time because there has historically been a stereotype, another stereotype, that Asians living in the United States are very quiet and passive and don't speak out. This is called the model minority. And you know, and if you think about it, it's like we don't cause trouble. So this is very much Asian Americans causing trouble. Maybe what John Lewis would call good trouble, right? <laughs> so so that was in the through the started in the 1960s, moved through the all the way to the uh late 70s for this particular movement. And then the film was released in 1983. Okay, so who killed, oh, there's a funny, who killed Vincent Chin? This is directed by Renee Tanjaba Pena, same person who wrote that last quote. And I will show you a little clip from it, the trailer. So again, documenting uh, in this case, uh, the beating death of a Chinese American man by two uh, white auto workers who um, claimed it wasn't a racist act, but uh, the film argues that it was actually an act of, of anti-Asian hatred, right, and anti-Asian violence. So even back in the 1980s, this was happening. It was something that is very much a concern now, of course, in the United States for Asians living there. So um, uh, Zhang Jing says, the questions raised by the film are much larger than one man's guilt or one mother's loss. Who Killed Vincent Chin provides Asian Americans with a sense of, his, of historic, historicity in their current struggle for equality and justice, meaning that it puts the, the past struggle in a historical context with... ...out of development on tap. The Packer plant used to be one of the key... Okay, I'll share. All right. So again, that's just showing an example of an Asian American film that was very much... Um, politically involved and try to take a point, uh, make a point and make, um, speak out for the Asian American perspective about this particular issue. Um, okay, let's see, how do I get back to my slides? Okay, there we go. All right, let's try to, so I think I need to reshare, right? Yes. No, no. Actually, if you stop at the upper left hand, uh, okay. it, it should work. Yeah, but no, 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 just go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's try next. Oh, I should. Okay. Okay. So this is the film that was made just in Ta second. Taiwan. Uh, oh, still loading. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that was an the Who Killed Vincent Chin uh, was an Asian American film. This is a film that was made in Taiwan in 2010 that is similarly looks at a political struggle 
um, and finds uh, tries to articulate a perspective that is not often seen. This is uh, migrant workers here in Taiwan who are were trying to organize their um, their factory. And it's interesting because it took the form of a, a love story between many of the women who work there um, because a lot of them paired off in as migrant workers working in this factory. But it really also showed, you know, just them working and trying to organize. So I'm gonna show you again the little clip because it's just uh, not too long. Yes. Okay. Will that work? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hopefully there's sound, you can see. This is an example. Yes. Okay. So it seems to be okay in this. Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So as it says here, Lesbian Factory uh, centers queer female migrant workers as historical proponents in struggles for social justice and transformation, mm -hmm. and as an inspirational source for radical aesthetics. So again, you know, even though this was not made by Asians living in the United States, I think it still acts as the same kind of film to to uh, express this point of view, to share this history, and to make visible the perspectives of the people who are involved. Okay. Okay, so now we'll see a few of my films. So this is a film, I don't have any text about this one, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's called All Orientals Look the Same, and I made this a very long time ago, as you can see, back in the 1980s when I was an undergraduate. Um, and at that time, I was very interested in, um, you know, same kind of thing, uh, the history and politics of Asians living in the United States and how to bring that perspective into media, right? Into film and television and other, back then there was no online social media, of course, but, um, and so I made this very short film and it just is a very uh, quick way. There was a stereotype in the United States that all Asian people, all Orientals, or called Orientals, looked alike. You couldn't tell a Chinese person from a Taiwanese person, from a Korean person, from a Japanese person. We all supposedly looked the same. So I wanted to uh, contradict that stereotype by just showing the different Asian Americans. Slow, slow, slow. It's showing up on my screen, but I don't know if it's showing up yet on yours. Well, I will just talk because we, this is just yeah, a, right. a placeholder slide. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to show this whole film. This is a, called The Chinese Gardens, and it is 17 minutes long. This is a film I made. Oh, gosh, when did I make this? 2013, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's no date on there. And um, so this is an interesting film because I made this when I was, uh, as Dean will talk about a little bit, mm -hmm. when I was staying in uh, the Pacific Northwest, which is the northwest coast of the United States uh, near Seattle. So north of San Francisco, which is where I'm from. And I was uh, doing uh, an artist residency there for a month in this town called Port Townsend, mm -hmm. very small. And I was walking around in the nature <laughs> up there. And I came across a plaque that said, this is the Chinese gardens. This is where the Chinese used to grow vegetables to sell in Port Townsend. And I had already been staying there a few weeks and I remember not seeing any Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what happened to all of these Chinese people that used to live in Port Townsend. The town itself was not very big, but I discovered that back around 1900s, that one quarter of the population of the town was Chinese. So there was a good, I mean, no, it wasn't, it was only maybe 2000 people living there, but still 500 of those people would have been Chinese. And there was a Chinatown and so forth. And by the time I got there in, you know, 100 years later, there was no Chinatown and there was no, no trace of these Chinese people except that plaque that I came across. So I did more research at the historical society there and I found out more about it. And so this film is just talking about that. Um, so I can either do the screen share, it'll be a little jaggy, or I can give them the link and they can watch it themselves. Which do you think? Or both? Um, maybe both. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to give you guys the link. And um, also, oh, I can't give you a link. Never mind. I'm just going to screen share. It might be a little bit jaggy because it's, uh, you know, on Zoom, sometimes it's that way. So I apologize if it's not synced up properly. Let me go back to this <clears throat> and reshare. <laughs> Where did it go? Oh. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All righty. So. Um, so you can see the same idea, just trying to uh, bring this story to light that is unfamiliar 
to uh, a lot of people, I think, even myself. I, you know, I didn't know that this had happened. I knew that there had been definitely uh, incidents of anti-Chinese violence up and down the West Coast, but I wasn't quite sure to the extent. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was interesting for me to do this. Okay, let's see. How do we get to the next slide? Oh, slide show. Okay, I'm going to um, talk about my current project, which <laughs> um, it's about a group that I was in during the uh, start of the pandemic in 2020 called the anti Sony Squad. And uh, in the United States, it was a very, very silly situation where um, the government did not uh, provide any protective gear for people. There were no masks. There was nothing for anybody who was frontline workers, medical workers, uh, you know, people who were considered essential workers, people working in stores. So it was very odd, we thought, um, that uh, all of these people who were really risking their lives because it was before the virus, there was a vaccines or anything, were, were not given any kind of masking or protection of any sort. Uh, and these, you know, doctors, nurses, so Christina Wong, who's a performance artist, decided to start sewing masks for um, these folks. And this is her very first Facebook post where she talks about, if you are immunocompromised, I will try to send you masks. And then as you can see, she immediately got a huge amount of people um, asking for masks. This is right at the beginning of, of the lockdown in the United States. So you can see these are dated uh, mid-March, late March uh, 2020. So nurses, uh, these are firefighters. Um, I'm not sure who this one is, but probably another, oh, firehouse, yeah. Nurse, hospital. So you would think that there would be masks for these folks, but there were not. Um, I, I think there's pictures, I may, in the clip I'm gonna show later, there's pictures of people wearing uh, plastic garbage bags because they didn't have any protective gear. It was amazing. So she decided she couldn't sew enough masks for all these people, so she started something called the anti sewing Squad. And so eventually we got, went on to, I'm going to skip a lot of this because I'm going to show the clip instead, that uh, we went on to um, sew more than 350,000 masks and donated them to mostly what we decided would be at-risk communities. We started out giving them to people like hospitals and, you know, frontline workers. And then eventually the government and the healthcare system did catch up in a month or so and did start to provide PPE for folks, but then there were still a lot of folks who did not have any access. Migrants, people working in fire zones, um, farm workers. Um, so we really tried, sort of pivoted to try to, to um, give the masks to people who really needed them, who couldn't even afford to go online and buy masks, right? Or they were given one mask that would have to last them an entire week. And I know when I, I used to explain this to people, I, I remember talking to some folks in Hong Kong about this right around there. I said, there's no masks and people have to wear these masks for a week and we had to sew masks for them. And the people in Hong Kong were going, what, are you insane? How could there be no masks? And I'm sure your government all gave you masks. You got like six masks a week, right? For everybody. And you would go down to the, the Watsons and get your masks, right? And that was great. Not in the US, it was terrible, terrible and still terrible. And not only that, but the president at that time started to be very anti-mask. And so he, you know, he was very racist. He called it the China virus. He did things like, so really politicized the whole situation. So the anti sewing squad really wanted to kind of oppose that. So we were we were around for another, um, about a year and a half. So here's the final stats. There were about 800 people on this Facebook group who were involved. We made about 350,000 masks. We sent relief vehicles with other supplies to places like um, the Navajo Reservation, clothes. Um, it's changed. Uh, it, it's it, not shown. Oh, it's not showing. Uh, uh -huh. Jeez. I'm sure it's loading. It's very uh, weird. Okay, sorry. Well, we'll hopefully the film will show. No, this one. Another one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, no? Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. All right. Um, we have a book that was put out by UC Press called The Anti Sewing Squad Guide to Masking, Radical Care, and Racial Justice. Mm -hmm. Christina Wong, who was the founder, had an off Broadway show that is won a lot of awards, and I am making a documentary film about it. So I made a shorter film, which I'm gonna show, um, and then I'll show, if I have time, I'll show you clips from the longer documentary. So this film is uh, eight minutes, and I made this back in June of 2020. So we were still right in the middle of the lockdown and the pandemic. 
Um, and the thing that was interesting about that, of course, is that in the United States, I guess here too, people were not allowed to really leave their houses, right? I mean, they could go back and forth. They weren't literally locked in their houses, but a lot of people were working from home. Um, you really wanted to avoid being inside closed spaces with anybody because there was no vaccine. Um, and so the way that I got a lot of these clips was that the people in the, the anti-sewing squad would send me their clips. They would film themselves on camera and then they put them up on the internet and I would download them. And that's how I got most of this footage. So it became really this really fun collaborative project between these you know hundreds of aunties sending me their clips and then um, I edited them all together. Okay, so I'm just gonna show this to you. And this is kind of a good introduction. So it was nice to have that really wonderful soundtrack to edit too. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, so we have a little bit more time. Um, so I'm gonna show you one last clip here, which is from the longer film that I'm trying to make about the anti sewing squad. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that, you know, on and off since about 2020. I've interviewed way too many people, about 15 or 20 people, I feel like. Um, <laughs> and so this is, I'm just gonna show you one of the little sketches that we did. This is not in any way, the way the finished film will look like, but it might give you a little more sense of um, how it would be slightly different than the clip that you just saw, the short film, which I feel like it's kind of a nice self-contained piece, but to <laughs> uh, you, you are done here. I am done. Okay, 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 done. Um, yes, right. Maybe uh, let me close. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, it's amazing to see how this uh, uh, racial violence mm. could take place in our daily life or in the governmental policy from 19th century to 20th century to today, right? And also uh, how people would act out their uh, discriminative uh, exclusion openly, publicly, right? Mm -hmm. Killing not only uh, the black, uh, but also Asian people mm -hmm. uh, without uh, their uh, uh, penalty. Okay. And so I think in about Valerie's uh, film, we can see that we, we try to think how to fight back in the isolated, unprotected corner, right? And also how to face the situation that uh, actually uh, encouraged by the state, mm. by the government, by the president, <laughs> right? Mm. And how to try to build up some sort of solidarity and self empowerment, but also empowerment for other related uh, communities, okay, uh, bottom up action. Okay, so we can also notice that how rich and flexible and uh, the document archive, uh, Facebook uh, messages and uh, everything, okay, that uh, a director can make use of, mm. okay, and also how to edit it in a very artistic way. Mm. Okay, so uh, I, I believe uh, Dean ha uh, has, uh, has a lot to share and discuss with you. So yeah, I'll give you a look. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was it was great too. Was, this is the first time for me to see the Chinese gardens. Oh. I saw the the other ones oh, okay. and a couple others. So I have, I have a lot of questions, but um, I'll, I'll uh, is that the best way to proceed? Is yeah, right. That common sure. question and then uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, 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 it's up to you. you. You can also put a list of questions, but uh, maybe pause in between. Uh, okay. Mm, yeah. yeah. And then you have more questions to to follow up. So okay. It's up to you. Yeah. So just off the bat, before I forget, mm -hmm. in the um, the Tacoma aspect, so that was done in um, 2012, like 12, 13, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I just went back after 20 years, and my, my house in, in Tacoma is just up the hill from that, just ah. a few blocks. So I, I used to walk there all the time. Mm -hmm. I took photos of um, Ken dolls when I was taking a photography class oh. facing the ships. And I know they're <laughs> going to build these 
the Chinese guard in there, mm -hmm. and it was that it was facing the two navy, navy ships that are parked there. They're supply ships, not uh, with weapons, but still it had a weird sort of feeling. And uh, during the organization, I was an uh, arts commissioner on a volunteer committee, and I got to talk with the people organizing the Chinese guard, and, and the issue was whether to have Chinese characters, mm -hmm. like I told you. But um, since then, since that photo, it's been totally redone. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the garden has a pagoda, yeah. a nice a nice uh, setup, and there's a many um, uh, like bulletin boards that mm -hmm. have the history now. And so that wasn't there when you were there, right? I think it was in progress. Yeah, that's why it was still blank. <laughs> They had the stru the big structures were there, but there was nothing written on them. Oh yeah. So because it was probably 2011, 2012. Yeah. yeah so it, yeah. what's really interesting, in because it ties in with your narrative, mm -hmm. it adds it actually fills in how the uh, people responsible mm -hmm. for organizing the putting Chinese on trains to Portland. This mm -hmm. is why Portland has this great Chinatown mm -hmm. part, part of this the story. Um, they were brought to justice and they were uh, convicted. Um. However, there, there was a retrial and oh, what a shame. There was a mistrial. Oh. One judge was hung, one of the jury members was hung and so they all got away. Oh. So it's the same story over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and But the way it's presented is uh, not bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really quite, quite moving. But I did notice there was um, vandalism on the the the, the uh, tigers, the, the mm. stylized tigers in front of the pagoda. I uh, noticed the ears were missing. Oh, really? Yep. Wow. Yep. Um, well, I just want, before I forget, to mention those mm -hmm. things. And then I have um, just a, a lot of little questions, and some relate to the, the craft, mm. uh, and then some are more just general. So mm. going back to your student film, All, the, All Orientals Look Alike, um, it's would you, because when I first saw it, I thought, oh, this is a conceptual art film. Yeah. yeah. But then it's really an activist film, and you reaffirm the activist both. side. It's yeah. both. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next question is, um, my feeling is that Asian visibility has improved since mm -hmm. 1986. Mm -hmm. Also, the use of multiple headshots has appeared regularly more now with digitalized mm -hmm. filmmaking. It's easier to do and morphing and all sorts of things like that. Also, there's so many uncategorized, uncategorized, is that a word? People today, mm -hmm. um, and, and including myself and my children and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, could you remake this today and achieve its original revelation of unconcealing the hidden truth of existence and diversity, or is it more a product of its time, would you say? Mm -hmm. And um, and then. I think you already mentioned this. How did you represent each nationality as one photo? They just have to be people you knew and just grab one. Right. right. They actually weren't matching with the, the names, though. They were supposed to be unmatched. It, it seems oh. to sync up in the beginning, but towards the end, it falls out of sync. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Those, those yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find any single one of them. Those oh. are mostly friends of mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I just was wondering if it would change in the digital age mm. with new or if it would still have the same impact. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. This is one of the things that doesn't work. Oh, uh, you can we'll share. Yeah. <laughs> so those are, yeah, the very good questions. I think, of course, it was very much timely at the time in the 1980s because I used to ask the question, how is this film different from what you see on television? And of course, now things have changed. First of all, it's in black and white, which was not common in television at that time. It was very short, right? At that time, people only watched 60 minutes or 30 minute shows. But then the main thing was that it was full of Asian people. And that was definitely something you didn't see on television back then. But now, maybe more. But even so, it's not as much, it's not proportional to the population, I'm right. sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I did. This is, I mean, this may be a little too uh, technologically. Uh, uh, detailed for some folks, but this was all shot in one take, and it was two slide projectors that I projected against the wall with a dissolve machine, because at that time, you couldn't do dissolves between images like that unless you had a very expensive editing machine. So now, of course, you can do that very, very easily on your phone, even, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, so it's very different. 
it was very different than it would have been made back then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Oh, great. Great. Oh, great. Batteries. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it working? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think you already talked about how you gathered the um, the the aunties mm. at home would have their people in their household yes. filming them, and then they would send them in. So yeah. that's entirely. So you never went out and visited them. Just no, to... we were not allowed to visit each other. <laughs> yeah, that makes. I mean, you yeah. could, but we would stand very far from each other. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and then the Cronus Quartet. Mm. I was wondering, it came because that one it's also I think in the short version and in the longer mm. version, the link that Joyce sent me, that there's a the where the the, the vision into this the square, the the quadrangles and, and then mm. it all sort of comes to a climax there oh, with the music. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you thought of that division and quad quadrilineal from the Cronus Quartet. Music, or if you just happen to edit it, so it. Oh, I'm. Long. I was definitely trying to match the 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 tone of the music, whatever the music was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, and I really love that that piece because it's very energetic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And interestingly enough, they picked that piece of music for us, the Chronos Quartet, and it's a Filipino American mm -hmm. composer, mm -hmm. a young composer in New York. So it was really appropriate, I thought. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think the music helped me to pace the film sure. and to make yeah. the visuals match. And mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, thank you. Um, that, that also makes a difference. Yeah. Music. Yeah. The yeah. rhythm. Mm. Yeah, there was uh, Grace also in Yafa. And um, you, we well, already. We didn't watch their. Yeah. Films. And, but I, if it's okay. If, so there's this Grace character. Mm -hmm. She's a, a Korean American. And she talked about how she felt like she was participating in the narrative of her mother who had right. experienced uh, World War, the, not World War, but the um, Korean War, Korean Korean War, War. Yes. which I could relate to because my mom experienced World War II as a German. Mm. And and so I, I, I just thought there was an inter interesting tension uh, there of how mm -hmm. we relate to each other through our family histories and yeah. folklore and have this shared commonality that transcends these racializing tendencies mm -hmm. within society. Usually we'll think of them as a line, but mm -hmm. I think there's something going on with my own experience oh, that's bringing great. to it yeah. that yeah. Uh, shows a potential for using family history mm -hmm. against the grain in mm -hmm. a way. I think it's really, yeah, really fascinating. Yeah, yeah so um, Dina's talking about the, another person we didn't see talks about, not only her grandmother in Korea having experiences where people helped her out, her grandmother out under great duress during the war, uh, but she also talked about the um, garment workers. There were, when Asian women came to the United States, many of them were seamstresses. They worked in garment factories. And so some of the people who were in the anti sewing squad, their parents or their grandmothers might have been seamstresses. So that was kind of, this is a way to pay tribute to the workers who came over from China or Vietnam or Thailand or wherever. And, you know, it was a nice way to connect to our own personal histories. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Yep. Okay, and um, and then I like her line. She says, "I wondered where the government was." I mean, yeah, this is, they're always the, the government. That's what I was talking about. How we yeah. didn't have any, we didn't get the maps spread, oh. given to us, mm -hmm. and it was very frightening because yeah. I mean, people would go out with they would have bandanas, you know, or whatever, <laughs> their mm -hmm. coat, or they just didn't go out at all. Mm -hmm. But for the people who had to go out, like the grocery workers, you know, yeah. or the people of the farm workers. Very, very scary for them. So that's what we were really kind of trying to address. Because we were lucky enough, most of us were, you know, middle class. You could stay home and stay in our houses. But what if you had to go out and work? What if you were what they called an essential worker? Mm. Or, you know, healthcare people. Mm. You know, exactly. People. Yeah. And also, Grace talked about the uh, sharing the joy of sewing and helping others, which is really beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's something I really would like to hopefully um, explore in the longer film. And I think in the short film you see it too, is just that we were all separated physically, but we came together on social media, right? Yeah. And we were so close to each other. And then when I finally did get clips from people, it was very much, it, everybody was so enthusiastic. They wanted to send the clips in. So um, the first time we all meet each other, met each other in person, you know, some 
18 months later, it was almost like we knew these people really, really well, like they were our best friends, but we had never spoken to them in person. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting. We would say that, oh, you're the person who made the chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> you're the person who you know, has the three cats that we would see on the Zoom clips. And it was really, I mean, we're still all very good friends. We still see each other all the time and have re reunions. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think Christina talks about it also in her play about similar to people who go through war together, like mm -hmm. who are fighting in a war together and then they all have survived, some of them survive. And then afterwards you meet up and you just talk about the war all the whole time, the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think that that was a similar situation. We were able to build this really strong bonds with each other uh, when we were physically separated. Mm -hmm. It was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but I was I was thinking more in terms of the, the joissance of um, doing something on the one hand to um, escape the, the, the sense of suffering um, and then how when depressed helping others is actually yes. such a big relief to oneself in that but and then Yafa and I can't I didn't write down the exact quote Yafa towards the end of her segment you have uh, something to the effect of the pandemic leveled the racialization that manifests divisions in Americans mm -hmm. among them. I can't remember exactly what it was. I heard that part. <laughs> but Yafa was one of the people who received the mask. She was a nurse, a healthcare worker. So she had a really different story. But she might have talked about that, just feeling that people were that she didn't know were helping her out and reaching out and trying to support her, even you know, whatever their racial background or ethnic like, background mm -hmm. might have been. Yes, yeah, so something like that. Okay, and then I have more general questions sure. that I just thought of after talking with you last night, <laughs> walking home. Oh, right. Um, uh, how how do you plan your interactions with interviewees? Do you, do you have certain categories or distinctions or a semiotic array of working concepts mm -hmm. around which you conceive of questions to explore? Or perhaps, perhaps is it more of looking for a certain visual or auditory cues mm -hmm. that are interesting or something that work well in the film? Um, that would allow you to work from the minutiae towards the themes in a mm. more grounds up approach? Mm. Mm. That's a really interesting question because mm. there were so many people to pick from to interview. Mm. So it's like I, you have to curate your interviewees because I can't interview 800 people. <laughs> mm. So certainly I try to find, you know, geographical and age, um, gender, um, you know, their immigrant status. Try to find people who have interesting stories, um, who look, who speak well on camera. You know, sometimes, mm -hmm. but you sometimes you don't know until you interview. Them. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I mean that those with the short clip. It was interesting because some people were really great talking to their phone. You know, they were wonderful, and you would never have known just by talking to them on a Zoom. So it it just depends. Yeah, that's a good question. As far as asking the questions, I think I try to keep in mind sort of the bigger content or themes that I want to focus on throughout the whole film. But if someone goes on a tangent or someone talks about a certain aspect, then I try to delve into that. And that's more just an interviewing technique. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you have ever done any orchestras or anything like that, interviewed subjects for your research, you know, sometimes you'll they'll you'll ask them one of your preset questions, and they'll say something that is very different than what you wanted to talk about, but it's so interesting. And so the key is to be able to have enough presence of mind to follow up <laughs> and not lose your thread. So um, it's it's challenging because then I'm you know they're on camera and they're very nervous and I'm very nervous. Uh, <laughs> there's a very expensive, the, the camera crew, and you're thinking, oh my God, the time is running out. I have to do this interview. So uh, I have a lot of notes, though, notes mm -hmm. that I keep. But um, but it's it's very much like a performance, I think, when you're interviewing people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like you're, you have to interact with them and draw that, draw out their performance as well as your performing, too. Mm -hmm. Like you're doing a duet with them. Oh. oh. This is how you can do mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That was very mm -hmm. enlightening. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this is about a film that I haven't seen, oh. but I've seen online. You can find uh, inter interviews with you about it, and uh, I think a, a, a sneak previews type of a, oh. uh, some mm. sort of short. And it's the Love Boat. One. Oh right, Love Boat Thailand. Love Boat. Yeah. <laughs> and it so happens that I've been hearing of my wife's trauma as a Taiwanese, oh. having to to cater to the needs of the. Uh, 
spoiled Americans. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and also the fact that her, her family is not um, KMT supporters, but oh. but had to pretend to during that period. Mm -hmm. And it has all these complications, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and because it's you you were it's like in the PRC today. You cannot be outside of the PRC, even if you're outside the party. You yes. can't declare it or anything right. like that. And very um, much the law was very restrictive. Yeah, so yeah. And um, so I wondered if that because I didn't see the film. Is that, <laughs> if you if you cover <laughs> their 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 point of view, and and then and then for the students, I think you, if you're not familiar that. So for the KMT, this was a form of soft power. Mm -hmm. But for the Taiwanese, promoting democracy was actually complicated. It wasn't necessarily against their interests because mm -hmm. it eventually did lead to this opening because they required to distinguish Taiwan from the PRC right. and, and, and so forth. Um, but it was also a form of legitim le legit legitimizing the one-party rule against these forces of democracies, out with, oh, Dong, Dong Wai, uh, people, right? Um, so just uh, so in, in any case, um, the the yeah, if you cover it, that complication of the point of view of the, um, of the Taiwanese. Taiwanese host, you know, yeah, the, there are. I talked to several counselors, Taiwanese counselors. Of course, all of them were children of KMT <laughs> officials, so they maybe did not have quite as much of a perspective because it was very much a KMT project. Uh, but even so, some of them were very interested in seeing the American point of view about Taiwan, and then they learned more about um, some. One of them talks about understanding the struggles of Chinese in America and how you know there's a lot of discrimination and racism, and that when you live. It, when you're in the hegemonic culture in Taiwan, you don't think that much about it. Right? If you're Taiwanese or Chinese, you don't think that much about that. Mm -hmm. So um, that was interesting yeah. to me. Uh, I think also the the some of the Taiwanese talk about how they did not like, like your wife did not like these American kids coming to the to Taiwan and really just running rampant over Taiwan. I, okay. And they thought they were very rude, and they thought they were very privileged, and they thought they were very spoiled, which they were. Um, and so, you know, there was, it wasn't all, not everybody in Taiwan supported this program because it was quite expensive. Also, the government paid for a lot of the expenses for these 1,000 American kids every summer to come over. So, you know, they say, well, why aren't we paying for things that people in Taiwan need? Why do we have to bring these American kids over? So I think, yeah, it was definitely more controversial than, than we think. Sure. Well, yeah. I didn't mean to put it down. Hey, First time, no opinion. Uh, uh, would, would you like to uh, just say uh, briefly what, what uh, is it about? What is it about? about? For the sake of the sure, other, sure. other yes. of course, I will saw it. But, uh, yes. So there was a program that was sponsored by the Taiwan, Taiwan's government starting in the 1960s, mostly by the KMT, that brought hundreds of Chinese American and Taiwanese American kids to the to Taiwan for the summer, and um, it was supposed to be a language and culture training. Uh, you know, we would visit monuments and such. But it be also became very popular in the United States as a way to have uh, romance, <laughs> because these are college age students that come over here. They get to spend six weeks here in Taiwan, and so the nickname of the program was the Love Boat or the Taiwan Love Boat, and um, it went on for. Several decades, I think it didn't. It went until the 2013, 2013. Yeah. Uh, but it was mostly popular in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, early 2000s. Um, so I did the same thing as with the aunties, as I tried to find as many people as I could and talk to them about it, and uh, just figure out why this became such a big cultural phenomenon. I went on this trip <laughs> when I was in college. <laughs> why it was such a big cultural phenomenon, and um, why it was so popular, and then what it meant to the people who came over here how they became, I mean, the love, you know, you think love is romantic love, right? But it was also, for them, it was like learning to love Taiwan and learning to love themselves and learning to love their culture. So it wasn't only just romantic love. So I thought that was kind of a nice way to think of it as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that enough? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's yeah. for people to yeah. know. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, 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 you're quite, oh. you, you can continue. Go oh, well, I don't, quite, oh, well, I don't have a whole lot, but, but um, yeah. I was just, <laughs> And now I understand you more now, so I don't. I understand why you would not do this, but it, 
because of homelessness is so there's a little bit of homelessness in Shinju if you go around mm. the station, but in, in America it's it's huge and, and my mm. brother in law in the Bay Area said San Francisco is really bad. Yeah, and Seattle. <laughs> Any warmer parts of the country. Yeah, and Tacoma too. Yes. I, mm. I was wondering if you I mean like I, I would guess that it would be uh, too obvious and not a, a just no story, no undertow to the story, but I wondered if you would how would you um suggest other people, if not yourself, would do a film about homeless people. Oh, in relation to the films that we saw, or just just you as an artist uh, oh, giving advice to students. Well, I mean, I always like looking at sort of the broader systemic, structural issues that cause things like homelessness. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. necessarily oh, these people don't want to have a job, or they're mentally ill, or you know, they're lazy. Um, you know, you have to think about why can't they afford housing? Why can't they afford to find a place to stay? Why can't they get a job? Why is there no mental health services that are helping them out? So for me, that would be the way that I would approach it. Mm -hmm. So similarly with the anti sun squad, why did we not have masks? It's not just because nobody wanted to wear masks. It's because, you know, the federal government was quite negligent in mm -hmm. providing that kind of um, support for people. Um, and then, of course, it did become very politicized under Donald Trump. And um, so it was just a horrible mess. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So mm -hmm. Would get... you like to make a documentary on homelessness? Ah, that's a big topic. Uh, if, yeah, when I retire and I turn, it's still <laughs> going, yeah. I think that there are probably many people who are, are still interested and have made films about that, definitely, yeah. But it's it's a big problem. But again, it's a symptom. It's a symptom yeah, of yeah. greater issues. Yeah, systemic and mm. systematic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly. Capitalism, it's a problem of capitalism. Of course, yeah. if you want to be uh, broader. There are indeed an uh, increasing number of homeless. In Taiwan? No, no, in the Oh, in the U.S., States. of course. Yes, yeah. very, yeah. very bad. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, I mean, some people point to the start <laughs> of uh, Reaganomics back in the 80s because he shut down a lot of mental health facilities. And then slashed many social programs that supported people who, you know, like food stamps or rural welfare, mm -hmm. that helped out people who are uh, struggling. Yeah. And so I, I don't yeah. think I think we see obvious increase of homelessness in uh, in Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. And some are of maybe or are they a little bit in Taipei? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, we need to check the statistics. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh. Mm -hmm. it, of course, also near this uh, uh, train station, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. maybe Taipei uh, uh, Central Station or other mm -hmm. station, but uh, in the streets, it's less mm -hmm. uh, obvious than, yes. for example, I went to Berkeley. Uh, in the street, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 yeah, right. But they yes. also say uh, a lot of them are in LA, mm -hmm. in, in yes. San Francisco, mm -hmm. and also this. Uh, Grab and go, or uh, this uh, uh, the mall. Uh, oh. People just uh, went into a big mm -hmm. store. Oh, well, yes, and again, it's because there's a lot of people who are unemployed. Unemployed, it's and difficult. Entry. So for me, if I was to make a film, I would say, why? why? What is it about Taiwan where there's less visible homelessness? You know, I mean, are there are definitely people who don't have. Places to live here. Well, if you are struggling, maybe they do have a place to live, but they still are having a hard time making ends meet. Mm -hmm. So why is it different from the U.S.? Mm -hmm. How is it? Sure. Maybe there's some cultural thing. People take care of their family members who are struggling. It's a smaller country. Maybe it's less mobile. I don't know. All but of these things. Ask owner, for example, under mm -hmm. underneath the bridge <laughs> <laughs> or uh, places mm -hmm. that they they tend to go. But yeah. uh, and not, not some of the temples, right? obvious. Yeah, the temples take them in though, don't they? Huh? Some people sleep in the temples. Yes, yes, a lot. Yeah, and yeah. also, yeah, they get mm -hmm. maybe free uh, mail. Right, right, right. Well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Now, okay, I'll, I'll shift gears to something yeah. more um, technical. Oh. Or, or but emotional too. <laughs> so, so this is about how. Um, I want to ask you your opinion of the use of music in documentary mm. films, um, I, because of the 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 way music is by used by Hollywood in such a manipulative way, mm -hmm. cringy, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
And given a sort of uh, Augusto Boal or Brechtian approach to dropping the fourth wall and forcing mm -hmm. people to engage without losing themselves in this empathetic focus on one, one uh, protagonist, music would seem to play a sim similar role, potential to fadai, the make people space out mm. into uh, 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 not having to think about something. So I wondered if you had any sensitivities about how how to manage that. Hmm. That's actually a very complicated question, but hmm. I mean, I think yes, definitely commercial films uh, tell you what to think or what to feel. Hmm. And for myself, I I like to take the approach um, where it, I actually like the audience to be more of a participant in the you know the watching of the film, so that they have more space to make up their own minds about what the topic is and what what they should think about it. So many times I will have many different characters who talk about different perspectives. You know, they may be um, conflicting. Mm -hmm. And so I try not to force my audience to only think one thing. You know, I'm, I really like the idea of having more of an open-ended conversation with the viewer. And um, and I know that that's definitely not something that is encouraged with commercial filmmaking. You want to have, I mean, it's literally called a Hollywood ending, right? You know, this expression, the Hollywood ending, where everything is tied up, the narrative is resolved, mm -hmm. happy ending, uh, all everybody's narrative story is complete. Um, but of course, in real life, there is no completion. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have like a tidy resolution in real life. And so I think for me, and that's more interesting, is just if you go away from the end of the film and you have more questions than answers in some ways, and you're, you think about things more, and that's what I personally like to do with the films, is just make, hopefully stimulate people to think and to form their own opinions mm -hmm. and not tell them what to think. <laughs> that, that's what my impression was. So, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so yeah. yeah. And then uh, the same question regarding the use of close-ups. Mm. <laughs> well, that's a narrative thing, a narrative filmmaking thing, or a fiction film. And I, when I teach my students, that's one thing they don't often think of is to use the close-up because it's a very powerful tool to focus attention on something mm. that needs to be emphasized in a story. And it's something you can't do in a theater production, right? You can't zoom in on something. It's always mm. going to be a, a wide shot. So to use a close-up, I think it's a very, very uh, strong way of making people, pointing out what people need to see. Like I always say, you know, well, if you want people to say they're, you know, this this key in someone's hand is very important, right? Or this object in someone's hand is important. You must cut to a close-up of that so that the audience is told what to think. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um. Let's see if I had anything else worthy of possible conversation. Yeah, you have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, it is here to do homework. <laughs> yeah, it's good. But we have questions from the students. Yeah, do you, oh, so, yeah, I should, I should relent the floor. Are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to as soon as possible, but keep to getting dragged back in. <laughs> Let, let's check around and see uh, whether we have uh, questions from hmm. the students. Yes, no, no, no. Uh, and also online, but uh, I do think this uh, documentary and the uh, filmmaking and also uh, how much uh, do we or the, the documentary filmmaker uh, need to refrain from some artistic intervention close up or montage or even maybe some surrealist uh, moments mm -hmm. to uh, uh, be inserted. Uh, would that deviate too much from the truthful voice of the documentary uh, author or would that increase the uh, space for their, I mean, other things. Mm -hmm. That I leave uh, for future uh, and uh, discussion for the, uh, later on. But let's get more 
question because we know Professor Stoll has another lecture to give ah. <laughs> at Bulan University. Uh, In so we, we end today's session by uh, 12 30. Mm. Okay. Mm. And we collect all questions. All right. So raise questions uh, as much as you can, and then you will address those mm -hmm. questions all mm -hmm. together. Oh, okay, so okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, uh, mine. Oh, uh, here it is. Uh, we can uh, circulate that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I uh, thank you for your presentation, especially for screening the films. It was amazing. So my question is about your film, or Oriental Soup the Same, mm. um, about more or less terms and the concept that they're lagging perhaps behind. So I'm not really aware of the association with the uh, categorization, ethnic categorization and racial categories in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure where, what, what the uh, Asian American means really, yeah. uh, because for me, uh, speaking about the film, um, the for example, people from India or Middle East, they are not included in the, mm. this category. Right, right, right. Yes. Uh, so basically, it's more about East Asian Americans or South yeah. Asian Americans. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you are trying kind of to break. Uh, for this term uh, Orientals or mm -hmm. Asian Americans and kind of replace it with different, mm -hmm. more complex identities, right? Mm -hmm. But still, uh, I think that uh, identities like Japanese or Chinese mm -hmm. are still quite ambiguous mm -hmm. for me. I I'm not sure. So do you think that you kind of um, doing this notion of naming people mm -hmm. by using this identity, you kind of reproduce this uh, notion of uh, identification mm. and maybe alienating them, um, not just judging by maybe their mm. personal biographies. Mm -hmm. um, for, for, because for me, like, I know, Chinese is still quite complex, right? So basically, who are the Chinese people? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really... Mongols! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah I, I, I just stopped here. Yeah. I just stopped here and I don't need here. Um, I was, yeah, I stopped here. Okay. That's that's really yeah. an excellent question. Uh, of course, this was made in the mid '80s. So uh, now, of course, there's many, many, many immigrants from South Asia and uh, West Asia, even right, or all sort of fall under this blanket. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, um, so, but you know, 1986, we were less enlightened. I think. I think also there was probably a smaller percentage of South Asians. I want to say between 2000 and now. The population of South Asians, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, yeah, Sri Lanka, right. in the United States has increased 81%, almost double. Mm. So huge numbers of people from that region. So I, yes, if I had to remake it, I would certainly put those folks in there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. But, you know, and of course it does privilege East Asians and Southeast Asia sure, to some sure. degree. Mm. So, and there's a big issue, you know, why don't we talk about these brown Asians, you know, in the United States? Yeah. Why is it only the, the fairer? Asians yeah. that we're discussing. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, that's very, very, very much uh, something that is now being talked about, you know, and we try to think about it. But in 1986, maybe we were less and aware. Also, and how to do an experimental film? I think that's and, amazing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Already. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's definitely a, time, you can it's, it's a product of its time. Sure. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good question. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, huh? Questions? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. We can talk about uh, the craft, whatever you like. <laughs> the thing, yes, whatever or you like. Or <laughs> or other things. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering if you're uh, currently working on any projects, or are there any future projects that you might want to work on? Mm. Well, I'm trying to finish the longer film about the anti song Squad, which I've shot a lot of it now. Um, I still need to shoot a little bit more. So I'd say maybe shot. 80%, 85. Um, and then the editing process is, takes a long time. Mm. So that would be the major project. But I am I have this sort of second project that I was thinking about in here in Taiwan, where I've been talking to um, some Tiwa. Yeah, Tiwa and uh, Nanyang Sisterhood. I can remember yeah. their real name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the Shao uh, Chi. <laughs> it's it's T something. T Tasset. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, migrant workers in Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. Who come here and then they're making creative work. 
So like Lesbian Factory uh, is from Tiwa. Mm -hmm. They produced that as their documentary film and they got their constituencies to work on that. And then Nine Nine Sisterhood or Taka, whatever mm -hmm. their name is. <laughs> they they work with what they call marriage migrants. Does anybody know this term, marriage migrants? Mm -hmm. I've never heard this term before I came here. It's uh, women from who come to Taiwan who are not Taiwanese, but they migrate here to marry Taiwanese men because there's a shortage of Taiwanese women, I guess, <laughs> who want to marry Taiwanese men. I don't know. But so, you know, there's a lot of women from Southeast Asia who come. And um, you know, they go through similar things that migrants to the U.S. go through. So to me, it's kind of interesting the parallels of these people who are displaced or who have to come here for economic reasons. I mean, I... Of course, you would like hope that some of the migrants are here for romantic, but it's probably political and monetary, right? They have to make a living and support their families. But anyway, um, so I'm interested in that. And that would be a project that I'm hoping to do after the anti sewing squad mm -hmm. film, but that might be not for another two, three years. It takes a long time. Yeah, but I do, I do like um, making connections globally or transnationally. Between different groups. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there. Uh, could I have a mic? Mm -hmm. uh, I speak. Uh, for one. Uh, question. Uh, on on the oh. chat room, but also uh, maybe a few questions. Uh, for our students. The first one uh, is here. Um, based on your presentation, uh, I acknowledge that you are trying to engage with. Documentary films are both in the theme of racial and ethnical uh, discrimination or marginalization on the Asian immigrant. I was could say I, I literally in, uh, uh, impressed with the simple but creative technique you use for all oriental look the theme, especially the repeated man vo voice on the sounding. Uh, thing uh, simply simple but it would, would emphasize on the producer's uh, text uh, text meaning uh, that is no these people are not the same totally they have their own individual identity of ethnicity race and culture I would like to ask if you have any relation with the themes of gender and sexuality mm -hmm. which Make the immigrant uh, stuck with the intertwined by both racial and sexual discrimination. For example, uh, someone who are Asian, homosexual, or queer immigrant. Uh, first question: To what extent this documentary film could support them with uh, emancipatory from the subordination under the aspect? Uh, of in this criminal uh this interdisciplinary when they are not only oppressed by the ethnically mm. by the ethnical uh, ethnicity but also their gender identity. Actually I'm uh doing a research regarding a queer cultural product, LGBTQ uh, literary work and film in Vienna. And I tend to criticize on the possibility of utilizing the representation politics uh, via uh, cultural process for the liter uh, li uh, liberation of the LGBTQ people from the social stigmatization or the gender self identification. So, uh, because you are following the field of media studies, I would like to ask second, uh, is there any scholar arguing, criticizing on the effectiveness or possible support of this cultural product on identity formation? Yeah. Ah, this uh, is a very great, good question. Great yeah, question. very yeah. good question. I think that um, now, uh, nowadays, uh, many people are looking at the idea of intersectionality. Yeah. You know, this intersect where you have many different ide uh, identities that make up your identity. So it's not only just that you're Asian or Taiwanese, but you might also be 
a woman, or you might also be a trans person, or you might also be a poor person, right? So, uh, and this also leads to intersections of oppression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is mostly focusing in the U.S. again, but I think it can be applied globally, of course, because there are certainly queer people around the world. Um, so I think that the most interesting work for me now is work that does look at that intersection, those intersections, and don't just focus on a single identity. So um, I'm sure there are many, many people who are, are looking at this, uh, especially in Asian American studies, because that's something that is uh, really a, a very uh, popular topic now. Um, but what you're doing, if you're doing work in Vietnam, that's also really interesting because another thing that many people are doing now in the US is looking at things more transnational. So not only just focusing on the experiences of Asian in the United States, but how that also relates back to mm. Asians who are still in who are in Asia, right? Mm. Because it's all connected. I think it's very yeah. global now. So uh, translocality, right? sure, sure, <laughs> yes, sure. translocal. Yeah. So um, thinking about how many of these things can find uh, expression across borders and within borders as well. So yeah, and within right. identities and across identities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially when, especially uh, when in some or most Southeast Asian countries, mm -hmm. this gender issue or mm -hmm. sexuality issues are still very much yeah. a ban. Okay, yes. very much. Uh, either it's because of uh, Confucianism or Islamism, patriarchy, <laughs> patriarchal yeah. and everything. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this uh, more conservative uh, context, I mean, mm -hmm. politically and also uh, ideologically, uh, it, it's uh, also more difficult to address. Mm -hmm. But still, we need to do it, right? So, yes. uh, maybe let let me. Uh, we have. 15 minutes left. Mm. I, I, I bring up, I'll bring up some, uh, a quick question, mm. okay, and okay. see how you will address, okay? Oh, but I, actually, I do want to add a little bit more about this uh, yeah. queer Asians question. Yeah. Many people are saying that, uh, you know, homophobia is not inherent in Asian cultures. It's actually a Western colonial construct. Because if you look at, for instance, like uh, Indian art from pre-colonial times, there are many representations of the same sex love, right? Uh, do you all know the legend of the cut sleeve in Chinese culture, right? The the emperor who cut his sleeve so his lover wouldn't have to, right? And so that's same same sex love also. So um, a lot of people say, you know, it's really not that Asian cultures are inherently conservative or, or religions. It's that it's brought on by this Western colonialism, which I think mm -hmm. is a really interesting thought. You, know, you can't blame everything on us. It's not all our fault. <laughs> so, okay, now you come Mm -hmm. uh, uh, bring me back to religion? another question. No, 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 no. Oh. Uh, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but in post-colonial mm -hmm. uh, independent nation state, they inherit the colonial they practices. Do. They do. It's, there's no way they're not polluted by it. Yes. So uh, people say uh, Indonesian ethnicity, there are a lot of uh, bisexual or, mm -hmm. or trans. Uh, mm -hmm. People, but uh, it, nowadays uh, it's not really uh, allowed or yeah. encouraged. Not yeah. not to say encouraged, but uh, it's still very much oppressed. Yeah. It's, it's very okay. complicated. Very uh, very on the one hand, they have the, for example, Thailand too. Okay, they have mm -hmm. the performance, a uh, performers or singer, public figure, but in daily life, they are still very much uh, legally right. suppressed. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, okay. Uh, in addition to what I said, the artistic, mm. uh, <laughs> I mean, so-called artistic, that might be, uh, for example, some uh, other uh, documentary filmmakers, they will use mm. this uh, very, uh, like, surrealist moment, mm. okay, montage, and mm -hmm. other uh, moments to maybe juxtapose or to sharpen the, the contrast mm -hmm. or, or extend the, the imaginative uh, space and mm -hmm. so on. So it's not just a uh, uh, document, mm -hmm. okay. But uh, that's uh, my curiosity, okay. <laughs> the montage and the close, close up and uh, outer space scene and so on, okay. But uh, a couple of uh, 
quick question. For example, a student wants to do a very short video essay on BL images, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. uh, literature or a cartoon or um, manga or other things. Uh, what would be the data or archive you mm -hmm. would think of? Okay, to add it. The other thing is, but of course, it's a popular uh, in Korea, or Thailand, mm -hmm. Taiwan, Hong Kong, everything. Okay. Uh, or people want to work on uh, Indonesian uh, a female artist intervention on this uh, gender inequality because mm -hmm. of this uh, 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 the Muslim mm -hmm. law of, mm -hmm. uh, and other things. Uh, what would be the images of the archive or data you would think of in your mind? Or the other possibility would be uh, if a student wants to work on uh, a document, uh, video essay on one being cinema film, mm -hmm. okay, one being who made this uh, Chu and then other uh, documentaries on this uh, cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, oppressed or uh, persecuted people and making uh, 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 several films. So the documentary, uh, screen documentary, that is, uh, they don't really interview mm -hmm. those people, but mm -hmm. they use this uh, screen image to make the documentary, okay, or maybe other possibilities. So uh, 10 minutes, oh. just a little brainstorming, I and you as a very uh, yes. experienced uh filmmaker <laughs> what would you if that's your project what would you do you know i mean for me it's so interesting what my students come up with because i feel like you all are so much more experienced now with finding images on screens and so forth than than i am at this point i mean everybody knows how to find search and use search engines and find every image i'm always amazed at what people can come up with so quickly you know, sometimes I'll just say, well, I'm not sure what this is. And then someone will go on Google, oh, here it is. You know, immediately, immediately, like seconds. And I feel like I can learn so much from these younger people now who have your visual vocabulary is so much broader than when I was your age or even when I was older. You know, in the past 10, 10 15 years, it's just like expanded so much. Um, I can't even keep up. <laughs> so um, I'm just curious, I mean, what... Do you all like to see more conventional documentaries that are longer, or do you would you rather have a like TikTok or you know or a shorter film? Is that something that is like are, is that the kind of visual language that you're attracted to, mm -hmm. or is it or do you like to be immersed in a longer film, mm -hmm. you know where you have a whole hour and a half to really stretch out and even every tiny detail, like is TikTok too short, too long? Or whatever, three minutes, seven minutes, twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. I I always wonder that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Let's that, uh, think more uh, concretely. Now mm -hmm. we are uh, encouraging students to practice a uh, video essay for about oh. not just three minutes, mm -hmm. but fifteen minutes. Content or thesis, mm -hmm. okay, just like a research paper, right. but a right. thing. A thesis statement, but with supporting mm -hmm. uh, visual archive and data yeah. editing, edited. Okay, and that can be published. There are mm -hmm. many uh, journals that mm -hmm. really accept uh, video essays. Yes. So, so uh, yeah. how would you say to, to the, the, those are the cases that I might do in my work? Mm. I think I would say maybe try to be, to listen to what you feel like you want to say and how you want to say it. I mean, it's good to know the basics, you know, how to tell a story in a, the conventional way, but don't be afraid to be unconventional. You know, don't be afraid to try something new, uh, as long as it doesn't become incoherent. <laughs> I mean, if you want to think of it, maybe uh, this is sort of a silly analogy, but if you're baking a cake, you know, uh, there are some things you do have to do that to make that cake rise. You know, and you can try, oh, well, I'm going to put in vinegar and ketchup. Will that help it rise? Because that's what I feel like I want to do. And maybe it will. Maybe vinegar and ketchup will work, but probably it won't. So, but maybe there'll be someone who thinks, I'm so tired of cakes that have sugar and eggs. I really would like vinegar and ketchup. So, <laughs> or, or we're so used to having vinegar and ketchup now, nobody uses 
mm. flour and eggs anymore. What are we doing? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I think that it's it's the visual language is now shifting so quickly that. Uh, but I said, that said, it's you know I do I do enjoy myself. I do be, enjoy being immersed in the film. Sometimes I get a little tired of these longer films, but if you give yourself the time, and that's sort of a, a something about modern life too, like how much time do we have? Do we have thirty seconds? Do we have three minutes? Do we have an hour and a half? Probably not an hour and a half, right? <laughs> Can we run it on two times speed and watch it that way? So yeah, so I think that yeah, it's yeah. it's it's tricky. Mm -hmm. I think you have to. In some ways, I feel like you if you start knowing the basics. Of how to make that cake, then you can then improvise and ad lib <laughs> your cake later. <laughs> but don't feel like you only can make the cake that one way. You know what I'm saying? You can embellish the cake as you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank we you. all know that uh, actually shooting. The segment also is a process of research and learning and thinking, right? So just like our reading books or poems or watching performance. So shooting the segment, and, but based on some provisional research questions, provisional hypothesis, and then collecting all different data, different information, both or uh, maybe a statistic or a governmental archive or uh, old photos mm -hmm. or uh, uh, newsreel mm -hmm. or uh, uh, interviews and uh, some screen images. And then to consider how you want to compose an essay, okay, through mm -hmm. this uh, cutting, editing, uh, and so on. So that Actually, people say this is a research by practice or a practice mm -hmm. uh, based uh, filmmaking or practice based research uh, or thesis mm -hmm. both ways. Okay, yes. because we cannot separate our uh, thinking and our artistic uh, intervention and our. Uh, uh, production. Okay, yeah. so it's all together. Thank you so much. It actually inspired a lot of <laughs> Yeah. Let's give uh, uh, Professor Thank you so much, everybody. We brought postcards. Yeah, they want a postcard. I have yeah, one. right. Yes. Let's uh, share. Yes, sure. there are many. So please, I'll leave them with you if you want. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. 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 Yeah. So we'll start our class now. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, oh, thank you. I do have a DVD. Please. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes I get.